Welcome. This is a public affairs forum presented by the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin, Texas. My name is Luther Elmore. We hold these uh, forums most Sundays here at our church sanctuary, 4700 Grover Avenue in Northwest Austin, and we'd invite you to attend. Uh, these uh, services are held to further the mission of this church, to nourish the mind and spirit, to serve social justice, and to inform and inspire. We've been holding these services, uh, these public affairs forums since 1954, the year this church was incorporated. And as far as we know, it is the longest continuously serving public affairs forum in the state of Texas. For information about this, you can go to our church website, austinuu.org. Today our presenter is Mr. Evan Smith. Uh, Evan Smith is the CEO and co-founder of the Texas Tribune, a pioneering nonprofit, nonpartisan digital news organization whose deep coverage of Texas politics and public policy can be found in newspapers, on TV and radio stations across the country, and in print and online editions of the Washington Post. Since its launch in 2009, the Tribune has won international claim and numerous honors, including a Peabody Award, 13 National Edward R. Morrow's Award, and the Radio Television Digital News Association and three general excellent awards from the Online News Association. Evan is also host of Overheard with Evan Smith, a weekly half-hour interview program that airs on PBS stations across the country. Uh, I've had the good joy to see some of those tapings at KLRU, and uh, Mr. Smith is uh, even better in person than he is on the screen. Uh, prior, prior to this work, he also served as, for, worked 18 years at the Texas Monthly, including eight years as the magazine's editor and a year as its president and editor-in-chief. Uh, Mr. S uh, Smith has spoken here before, and it's with great pleasure we welcome him back. Evan. So a couple, uh, thank you, Luther, very much, and, and uh, thank you very much for having me back. Of course, I'm happy to be here. A couple notes before we begin. The first is, Luther's story of how he got me to speak here is proof that I will do anything at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> Just go away. It's 5.30 in the morning. What do you want me to do? Yes, fine. I was actually nice about it, and I was sincere about it, but it is the 5.30 in the morning part that is the central fact in that story. The second thing is I was talking to my mother on the way over here in the car. She is, uh, lives in the, in, on the East Coast. She is a lapsed Jew. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going over to speak at the Unitarian Church. And she said, why are you going to speak at a church? I said, well, the Unitarians are very civically conscious people. And I said, I've been to this church and I've spoken to them before. I said, besides, you'd like them. The Unitarians are like Jews, but in a good mood. <laughs> and there was silence on the phone. I didn't mean to offend her, but... I've been not meaning to offend her for going on 52 years. Um, I, I am indeed here uh, in part because of Donna Howard. Donna Howard is somebody to whom I uh, turn often. You know, I don't have a, a political party or a, a political affiliation or an ideology particularly. Basically, I hate everybody. Um, but I respect Donna Howard because I believe Donna Howard, uh, in the work she does, uh, is a public servant as the definition of public servant uh, uh, ought to be uh, uh, written out. Uh, and Donna Howard has given herself to any number of organizations and, and often gives herself to the Texas Tribune. I, I, I'm doing something with Donna on Friday, uh, a conference of the Texas Association of Faculty Senates in Austin. And it's a discussion of um, issues in higher education. And they said, you can ask anybody to come and be with you who you want. And I thought, well, Donna Howard, who is uh, quite knowledgeable on the subject, would do it. And more than just her knowledge, I also was aware that Donna has a, uh, an inability to say no. Anytime I asked Donna to do something, she says yes. And so it was with that thought in mind, her generosity and always saying yes, that when Luther came up to me and said, would you come and speak at the Ethereum Church? I thought about D Donna Howard's face popped into my head and I thought, well, she always says yes, so I should say yes. And I was glad to be here. So uh, I'm going to say a few words about the Texas Tribune as a context for the, as context for what I'm going to talk about with you today, which is really the, some observations on the state of the <clears throat> political universe and the world that we all w live in, which you know every day now amazes me. I thought that my capacity to be astonished had been exhausted, and then every day I wake up and I discover, nope, uh, 
uh, every day it's something else uh, these days, and um, uh, and we'll talk a bit about that aspect of the world. Um, we have now been in business for more than eight years. No one is more surprised uh, to be standing here more than eight years in than I am. Uh, when we started the Texas Tribune, it was in response to a problem that we had identified. It was not a problem that we had done any research into or done any uh, field testing, feasibility studies, but it was a sense that was anecdotal more than driven by data that the world did not have enough coverage of public policy and politics. And by the world, I mean our world, specifically Texas, not Austin, but the state. Um, I moved to Texas more than half my life ago to work at Texas Monthly, 1991, fall of 91. When I moved here in the fall of 1991, there was still a Houston Post to go along with the Houston Chronicle. There was still a Dallas Times Herald to go along with the Dallas Morning News. There was still a San Antonio Light. There was even still in the early part of the 1990s an afternoon newspaper in El Paso to go along with the morning paper. Bookmark the El Paso uh, note for a bit when I talk about the El Paso Times today. And beyond that, the number of reporters at the Capitol in 1991 was three times what it was when I left Texas Monthly in 2009 to start the Texas Tribune. There, is, there, there was in 2009, without question, didn't need to do the analysis of this, we just knew it, much uh, uh, less coverage of public policy and politics because there were fewer venues to go to get reliable information, places that were publishing on a regular basis or airing in the case of broadcast, information about what was happening in the state of Texas, and there were many fewer reporters. And even what was left was not giving itself over to coverage of this stuff. You know, you had to really hunt around in the newspapers that remained in the middle part of the 2000s, uh, 2007, 2008, to find even coverage of this stuff. And you can understand why. The economics of the media business in the first decade of this century began to contract. And the news organizations and media companies in Texas, like uh, the news and, and media companies elsewhere, could no longer afford to do everything that they did once upon a time, and they had to make choices. You run a business, you decide if you have less money, I'm going to have to stop doing certain things. They made the decision to stop covering this stuff, broadly defined, public policy and politics. And I wondered why, but I didn't have to wonder after too long because I met with the editors of the five big city papers, Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, right before we launched a Texas Tribune. And I said, look, this is what we intend to do. We're starting a news organization from the ground up for the purpose of covering this stuff. We believe that there's a public interest uh, in, in doing it and in providing people in the state of Texas with more information about these things that affect them undeniably, public education, health care, immigration. Every decision made at the Capitol in Austin, and by the way, the Capitol in Washington, affects the lives of every single person in this fast-growing and dynamically changing state. Population is growing, not shrinking. The problems are more, not fewer. The problems are more complicated and complex, not less. And yet there's less coverage. It just seems, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And the editors of the, we were sitting at a conference table at downtown office building. The five editors of those five big city papers, again, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, Austin, Fort Worth were on one side, and myself and my colleagues, a couple of my colleagues at the start of the Tribune were on the other side. And we refer to this as we tell the story as the Easter Island meeting, because the five editors sat on the other side of the conference table like the statues on Easter Island, <laughs> unsmiling, unblinking. And we said, we just think that there's this need for this content that, that's not being provided. And they said to us, not in these words exactly, but effectively in these words, um, We've stopped covering this stuff because no one cares. And I said to them, you have it exactly right, but you have it exactly backwards. No one cares because you've stopped covering this stuff. The role of the media is something that we'll talk about in a second in terms of its, really its fiduciary responsibility. There's no other way to think of it except as a fiduciary, that there's an obligation of the media to tell all of us the things that are important enough for us to stop in our busy lives and pay attention to. The media doesn't tell us to pay attention, we won't stop. If we don't stop to pay attention, then we won't participate civically and we end up where we are now. So we started the Texas Tribune as a, as a solution to the problem of a lack of coverage of public policy and politics. It's a website, principally texastribune.org, but as, as you heard from Luther, that's only a part of the story because the copy that we produce is given away to run for free in news organizations, newspapers, TV and radio stations, and websites around Texas and around the country. And increasingly, our stuff has become the stuff that the people outside the big cities, and in many instances inside the big cities, now turn to to find out what's happening in public policy and politics. The mission of the Tribune has unchanged from before we launched. The key words here are nonprofit and nonpartisan. Nonprofit is an acknowledgement of the 
reality of the economics of the media business, if there were a for-profit model to enable this stuff, the for-profit media companies would be doing. They have to make a dollar, they have to make a return on their investment, their shareholders or their whomevers have got to get paid. Um, from our perspective, there's a public interest uh, in providing this kind of copy. It makes the, uh, uh, the community better and smarter and more informed. We create thoughtful and productive citizens every day through the work that we do. It's consistent with you know, a public interest organization. We sought and got a 501c3 exemption from the IRS so we could raise money from individuals, foundations, and corporations to support this organization. The nonprofit model makes it possible for us to do this. You go to individuals, foundations, and corporations and say, give us a couple bucks, or in some cases more than a couple bucks, to allow us to do this work, and your community will be better for it. We've raised more than $50 million in eight years across the state of Texas to do this. Well, Clap, clap for them. I mean, I, you know, I, I give a little, but um, look, the, 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 what's amazing to me about the fundraising for this organization over the last day, first of all, there was no guarantee this would work, right? I mean, obviously public broadcasting, to which I have a strong connection, and, and public radio, to which I have a, a slightly less strong connection, but a strong one, uh, have been making a, a go of this for some time. But there's a limited amount of money in the world, and there are a lot of problems to be solved by the kind of people who have a fixed amount to give away every year, and so they could give it to those organizations or they could give it to us. I can't argue that you should give to the Tribune as opposed to giving to cancer research or to Safe Place. You know, we just had an entire week national conversation, not for the reasons we wanted to, about domestic violence. Can I argue really not to give money to the to Safe Place or to the Children's Shelter, but give it to us? No. The hope is that there is enough money out there to be divided among the good causes, and in our case, $50 million plus has been the, the great uh, f good fortune uh, that we've enjoyed over these eight years from people all over the state. And I'll tell you what's interesting is the most Republican Republicans and the most Democratic Democrats at a high level supporting us, people who agree on nothing us but the value of our work. And that gets to the second thing, which is nonpartisan. There are a lot of places I go, Austin and the Unitarian Church particularly, I don't have to persuade you that nonpartisan journalism is possible because this is kind of a home game for me, right, in terms of this talk. But if I'm in Texarkana or if I'm in Alpine or if I'm in Donna, Texas, and I talk about nonpartisan journalism, there are snickers. They think that it's like jumbo shrimp, an oxymoron, you know. <laughs> Look, you know, we live in the United States of confirmation bias, and I we don't need to be part of that problem. There are plenty of places to go to get your bias confirmed. We all curate our satellite radio channels or our cable boxes to only let in voices that agree with the ones inside our heads. We choose our, you know, our team. It's, we're, it's tribalism, right? This is the problem with the world right now is that people are, are sort of retreating to their familiar uh, corners. When the reality is most people don't have a corner. You kind of live in the middle. You may have strong beliefs, passionate beliefs, but at the same time, you understand that the way forward is by finding things to agree with people about or on, not the reverse. And unfortunately, so much of the public discourse these days is about disagreeing and about not solving problems. You know, we think that nonpartisan journalism is not only a possible thing, I and mean, we've proved it now for more than eight years, but that it's actually the only way forward because if you give people information that they can rely on to make smart choices for the benefit of themselves and their community, then they're, in, then they're able to, to realize the obligations, and I do think that they're obligations of, of citizenship and a democracy. We have a terribly under-engaged state. That's going to be a persistent theme today. And in part, it's because people don't see that they have a place uh, uh, at the table or a role to play in solving these problems and in making the world better and in moving us forward. And we in the media business who retreat to those corners because that's where the audiences we think are, where that's the loudest voices out there are, uh, uh, we are part of the problem for doing that. And we, did, we want it to be part of the solution in creating a nonpartisan news organization. And I, I, you know, we don't editorialize on issues. We don't endorse candidates and campaigns. Um, you know, we give you the information that you need to be uh, a, a better at this you know, idea of citizenship. Um, we do not have to tell you what to think, as many news organizations believe they do. We, we have to tell you to think. You know, th th that is an important distinction because, you know, we're talking about basic stuff here, but what to think we don't have to. Um, we limit ourselves to public policy, politics, and state government because that's where the public interest need is. That's the, th that's the unmet demand 
and the unmet need, and we're solving that problem hopefully with supply. We don't need to be covering sports or covering the arts or what have you. That, that, that's just not really an argument for that. Um, since the beginning, three things that we have done, news, data, and events. The news tends to be of uh, daily uh, uh, reporting, kind of breaking news and daily reporting, uh, breaking news reporting uh, along the beat reporting lines. We started out with eight vertical beats at the Tribune. We are nearly nine years in rethinking the beat structure that was a defining feature of how we set up at the beginning. The beats are public education, higher education, immigration, criminal justice, transportation, healthcare, energy, and the environment. There was a lot of wisdom, I think, back nine years ago when we started to uh, attaching ourselves to these familiar vertical areas of content. But of course, immediately we saw, well, but actually there's this and there's that and there's intersectionality here and we need to actually be thinking about this in a different way. Um, those beat structures still tend to define us in the sense that those eight areas are key areas, but they're not the only things that we cover. When we started, we had 17 people. The first day was November the 3rd of 2009, 11 reporters. Today, we actually have 75 full and part-time working. And we have 35 reporters. We have the most reporters for the fifth consecutive year covering a state capital of any news organization in the entire country for profit or nonprofit. And the reason is you cannot accomplish anything small. I did not want to limp out of the gate. You know, I, I'm a baseball fan, right? My sport, if to the degree that we all have a sport that we like more than any other, if you have one, mine is baseball. And I'm an American League fan. And when I grew up, the Milwaukee, this is going to seem like a weird story to be telling in the middle of this, but trust me, it goes somewhere. Um, <laughs> when I was growing up watching baseball, the Milwaukee Brewers were in the American League. By the time... We started the Texas Tribune, wasn't just immediately before, but for a number of years now, the Milwaukee Brewers have been a National League team, so I no longer pay attention to the Milwaukee Brewers. But when the Milwaukee Brewers were in the American League in my youth, there was a man named Cecil Fielder who played first base for the Brewers. This really big guy. I'm watching the All-Star game, the April, or the July, pardon me, before we start the Tribune, and the Home Run Derby is on the night before, and my son, who's then nine, and I are watching the Home Run Derby, and up to the plate in the middle of the Home Run Derby walks this Milwaukee Brewers player, who I've never seen before, because I don't watch the Milwaukee Brewers, and his name is Prince Fielder, and he turns out to be the son of this first baseman I watched when I was growing up, and he is the biggest person I've ever seen on earth. <laughs> and, he's, and he's in the Home Run Derby because he's, you know, just amazing in the strength of 50 people and so he gets up there and every time he swings he swings as hard as I've ever seen anybody swing in my entire life and half the time he misses by a mile and he corkscrews himself into the ground a couple times he probably fell over but half the time he connects and he hit the ball 20 miles and when we were starting the Texas Tribune I said out loud we should be doing Prince Fielder journalism we should be swinging at the ball as hard as possible every time up and we're going to miss sometimes and we're going to fall down but when we hit we're going to connect and we're going to hit the ball 20 miles i have a picture of prince fielder actually in my office um, the, the the unofficial motto of the texas tribune is the texas tribune does not hit singles and that goes back honestly honestly it goes back to that conversation so i mentioned that we had 17 when we started we had 11 reporters um Today we have 75, we have 35 reporters. Well, what we could not do in the beginning, but what we can do now is investigative journalism because we didn't have enough people. We didn't have the manpower to do it, but now we do. And so we have a team of five people. All they do is investigative journalism. All they do is overturning rocks for an extended period of time to try to solve the problem of waste, fraud, and abuse in government, holding people in power and institutions accountable. And often it's... Alone, it's just our folks doing it, but in the case of the slide I have up here, a major project we did about the last time there was an attempt to take land from people to build a border wall 10 years ago, or a little more than 10 years ago, what a disaster it was. That was done in partnership with ProPublica. You know, the barking watchdog aspect of journalism is really the one that appeals to so many people the most, because at the end of the day, whether you like the media or not, whether your default setting is to trust the media or not, when the media uncovers, exposes wrongdoing by people in power, and those people have to stop doing wrong, then people get it. They understand what they're doing. And I want to tell you that the thing I am proudest of over the last 12 months is the extent to which not setting out to put pelts up on the wall like this is the big house at the King Ranch, right? But just doing our jobs, we have managed to root out waste, fraud, and abuse and make 
a difference. A year ago, we began reporting on corruption, really waste of taxpayer dollars at the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, where the senior executive leadership of the TABC was traveling out of state to liquor industry funded junkets. I mean, it was just the most, I had to look at these stories that we were publishing multiple times because I kept thinking, surely I'm not reading this. And so as a consequence of our reporting, there were a series of legislative hearings and immediately the top person at TABC resigned as a result of the reporting that we did. And then I think now we're up to something like eight or nine people from the agency at the top of the TABC as a consequence of our reporting resigned. More recently, we reported on a dysfunction at the top of the Texas Facilities Commission, an agency that nobody in the state of Texas ever gives a thought to except it's responsible for all the government buildings. And it is, you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars. And the former state representative, Harvey Hildebrand from Kerrville, was appointed to lead after he left the legislature and made an unsuccessful run for controller in 2014, put into charge of this thing, and it immediately just was rife with dysfunction. And so, that this first reporting on this happened in December, and by the end of January, as a consequence of our reporting, the Facilities Commission clears out the dysfunction. Harvey Hildebrand is out. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we reported on one of the five appointed transportation commissioners at TxDOT. These are all appointed by Governor Abbott, a man named Victor Vandergriff from the Metroplex, who it turns out had private clients. Uh, he was lobbying, not in a literal lobbying registered lobby sense, but he was advocating for on, on their behalf, people in the auto industry, at the Capitol during the session. And he was doing transportation commission business in Austin, and he was basically billing taxpayers for travel expenses associated with his private client work. And so we said, this is wrong, and he copped to it, and he paid it back, and then he resigned. Now, these are just three examples. There have been countless others. Journalism can make a difference without regard to party or ideology in rooting out waste, fraud, and corruption at all levels on all sides of state government and force government to do what it ought to be doing and not what it should not be doing. And this, to me, is the opportunity, the promise, and the potential, and to some greater degree today than ever before, the success of the work that we produce. I said we give everything away. Uh, we have an email that goes out in the afternoon every day that says, here's everything on the website. It goes to about 250 news organizations, the editors and the signing editors of news organizations around Texas. Here is everything that we have on the site today. Here's everything we're going to have on the site tomorrow. Come take it for free. We've assigned photography, cleared the rights, paid the photographers. Take the photographs. You can have those and use them if you have no money to pay for your own. We create graphics. Take the graphics. Run them in your uh, pages. This is a radical idea. People think, wait a minute, you're creating all this copy and then you're just giving it away? Yes, but shouldn't you be creating revenue off of that? Well, first of all, these news organizations don't have five cents to pay for this. Um, the second thing is, honestly, the philanthropic ask is enhanced around Texas with the knowledge that you're not only helping us create this content, but that the repeater effect is that it's running every place in the state. And it doesn't always run in the big city papers because the big city papers are really the only ones who still have any reporters left at the Capitol, fewer than they used to. But it will occasionally run on the front page of the morning news of the Austin states. But here's where the opportunity. There are 5 million paid newspaper readers in Texas. Half of them are in those five big city papers, but half of them are not. Half of them are in places like Tyler, Longview, Marshall, Waco, Corpus Christi, Amarillo, Lubbock, Brownsville, Harlingen, McAllen, El Paso. And you know what? They run our stuff all the time and increasingly on the front page. We have become, over these eight plus years, the statewide State House Bureau. And here's why this is important. Two people, Ham and Evan. Ham lives in, let's say, Tyler, and I live in Austin. Schools matter to Ham, roads matter to Ham, healthcare matters to Ham, immigration matters to Ham, every bit as much as it matters to me Ham and Tyler and Evan and Austin. Ham is every bit as much of a Texan as I am. In fact, arguably, he's more of a Texan because I live in fake Texas. I live in Austin. <laughs> he lives in real Texas, right? At election time, Ham gets the same one vote that I get. But the problem is Ham, by virtue of having lost the geographic lottery of sorts, does not go into the voting booth with that one vote 
with the same level of informedness that I have in Austin. He doesn't have the same information about the issues, the stakes he has, and the outcomes of those issues. He doesn't know the candidates. He may not even know who represents him because no one's telling him. That's wrong. That inequity is wrong. That is the inequity that we are trying to rectify by giving our content away. And I have to tell you, it's making a difference. When we go around the state and go into these communities with events that we put on, it is remarkable to see how much in eight years the awareness of these issues has changed by virtue of there being a steady stream of this content in the papers and I love that part most of all. The data that we do is big databases of public information that people don't know are available to them that they're public even. They wouldn't know where to go get them if they did know and they wouldn't know what to do with them even if they went and got that data set. We go get them, we clean them up, we make them searchable and sortable, government employee salaries or every conceivable bit of information about all 8,600 plus public schools and more than 1,200 school districts in Texas, test scores, graduation rates, college readiness, how much teachers are paid. I mean, every conceivable thing that you could want to know. You as a member of the public ought to be entitled to this. And in fact, the information is out there in bits and pieces around, but you need to hire a private detective to go find it. You know, government makes it really hard for you to stay uh, up on this stuff and they shouldn't they should make it easy so we make it easy if they won't make it easy we'll do it and then events we do more than I like to say we do more than 50 events a year the reality is last year we did 62 um, these are uh, editorial events these are not barbecue festivals and bridal shows there's a place for that stuff I'm talking about elected officials policymakers, newsmakers up on a stage in front of an audience, on the record, free to attend, open to the public. We ask hard questions of these people about the work they do in your name or don't do. And then at the end, you get to ask questions yourself. Ham and Joanne Richards are two of my favorite people in the world by virtue of having been at probably more Texas Tribune events over the last eight years than anybody I know. But there are a lot of people in this room I know who've come occasionally to our events. And we do them really because we believe that this is journalism. It is journalism to put an elected official on the fabled hot seat and to force them to answer for the work they do. And these are not interrogations in the sense that these conversations are unpleasant or hostile, though they'll occasionally get to be unpleasant and hostile. But it's more about getting them to talk about what they're doing and why and the priorities they have and our priorities by extension. Um, and I'd say to you, I'd encourage you, we have two coming up this week at the Austin Club, Thursday and Friday, Sarah Davis, the state representative from uh, Houston, who Governor Abbott has decided to come after in her primary. Really, it's going to be as much a conversation about Republicans and Republicans being unable to get along in a state where Republicans overwhelmingly dominate. I mean, that's kind of the political narrative. And then Friday, we have that nice Sid Miller, the agriculture commissioner, <laughs> who is a delight to talk to. Um, we live stream our events. If you don't, uh, if you don't get to be there in person, you can watch them on your phone or your computer or your tablet in the moment, and then we put video up in a, in a summary of the event after the fact. Again, this is all in service to the idea that we can all be better informed and that there's a good way to do it. Um, some of you probably have been to the Texas Tribune Festival. This is now seven years old. This will be the eighth year on the University of Texas at Austin campus for the first seven years. We had uh, Ted Cruz and John Cornyn together, which... Somehow my newsroom, average age 26, did not think this was funny. I thought it was hilarious. I said, look, we have John Cornyn and Ted Cruz together. That's like Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin back together for one night only at the Flamingo. <laughs> and the questions I got were roughly, who is Jerry Lewis, who is Dean Martin, and, and what is the Flamingo? We had Al Franken, remember him? And we had Susan Rice, and we had a big conversation around the, uh, the resistance to the president in the first year that featured Cecile Richards and Ezra Levin, who was the founder of the Indivisible Groups, but is himself a native of Austin, among others. I mean, it was, you know, 250 or more people spoke over the weekend, and, this, and more than five, about, about 5,000 people attended. It was a great uh, event. If you care about this stuff, it's a fantastic way to spend a couple of days. We just announced that we're moving downtown with the festival this year in year eight, the dates have just been announced, will be on downtown streets and in downtown venues. It's gonna be the biggest festival we've ever had. And I'm telling you, this is the year for it. Boy, oh boy. All right, so let me talk about politics now. And let me talk about the world we live in. Obviously, a different person up here is gonna have a different perspective. And honestly, I might have a different set of, five, I'm gonna talk to you about five things. That's the construct. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the five things that are of interest to me at this moment 
a week ago or a week from now, this might be a different, maybe not that different. But as I think about the world and as I think about the defining narratives that converge and diverge and that really define the world that we're all living in and thinking about, these are the five things that are on my mind that may be of interest to you at the moment. I'll take questions at the end, and if I don't get to something that you wished I'd talked about, certainly ask. I'm not holding back on it. The first observation I'm going to make is that Texas is more like Washington, D.C. than it's been in the 27 years I've been here. I've been at the Capitol for 13 legislative sessions, more than some people, but fewer than others. I don't pretend to have great expertise at this, except I've just been here and I've watched and I've had my eyes and ears open this whole time. And what I've heard at the end of every legislative session and certainly in every election season is, oh, Washington is so terrible. Oh, thank God that we're here in Texas where it's not like that. They're so bad. Oh, they can't get along and they can't get things done and partisanship is so bad and it's so wasteful and oh, da, 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 da. And they go on and on and on and on about how great Texas is and how terrible Washington is. I love Texas more than any non-native could love this state. I will, I will put my dukes up and fight anybody for that uh, title. It, it is not disrespectful to Texas to call bullshit in the Unitarian Church, right? <laughs> it is not disrespectful to Texas to call bullshit on that and, and in fact to say that the exact opposite of what we're being told is true. There has never been a moment where Texas is more like the dysfunctional Washington of myth and lore than it is now. And, and it begins with the disappearance of the political center. This is a graphic that the Axios News Organization uh, uh, put up a couple of weeks ago that I liked and it shows the the moving of what we think of as the traditional center of the parties from the literal center to the edges over a period of years none of this what, what is implied by this graphic is not a surprise or should not be a surprise to anybody we know that the center in politics is gone and that what is the center of the parties has moved ever closer to the edge this is the disease not the cure, this is the disease. This is why we're where we are in so many respects. And how it plays out in Texas and the degree to which Texas is more like DC as I would assert than ever before really is about the inability of, of the people in charge and the parties to get along. There are a lot of fights that played out over the last legislative session that I think if you don't isolate them within the time frame of the legislative session but you kind of step back and look at them more holistically or existentially, you come to understand the, the, the nature of the problem that we have. Um, on the left is Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. Never has the word left and Dan Patrick been used in the same sentence. Uh, on the left in this picture is Dan Patrick. He is a statewide elected official, Lieutenant Governor of Texas, presiding officer of the Texas Senate, which has 31 members. He is not a member of the Senate, but he is the presiding officer of the on the right is Joe Strauss, the Speaker of the Texas House. He is not a statewide elected official. He's one of 150 elected members of the House, represents a district in San Antonio. The Speaker of the House, by tradition, is elected by the vote of his, and I say his only now because there's never been a female speaker, his fellow members. And he is now in his fifth term as Speaker, which ties the record all time. Two other speakers have served five terms, and he has announced that he is not going to remain in that job, so he won't break the record. In the middle is Greg uh, Abbott, the, um, the governor of Texas, you know, in, in the literal center office and when the House and the Senate come to agreement, as rare as that is these days on legislation, it goes to the governor's office for the governor to decide what to do, sign it or let it go without a signature or to veto it. Um, Dan Patrick is a Republican, Joe Strauss is a Republican, Greg Abbott is a Republican. There has not been a Democrat elected statewide in Texas since 1994. 24 years. I have people working for me in like really important jobs who are doing really amazing work who have never been alive when a Democrat was elected statewide. In fact, the problem for the Democrats is so, it's so pervasive at elections like the ones we're having this year where no Democrats been elected for 24 years. No one remembers when a Democrat was elected last. There are no people who ran campaigns 24 years ago who are still around. They have to import people from out of town because there's not even any infrastructure to run campaigns. They always bring some poor woman in from Virginia to run a statewide campaign that she knows she's not going to win anyway. She's not even sure she's going to get paid. She checks into the extended stay America. She shows up at the first meeting. She thinks it's pronounced Manchaca. <laughs> she goes back to the airport, gets on a plane, is never heard from again. This is every single election cycle. There isn't even like campaign infrastructure to run these campaigns because no one was around in 1994. 
the last time Democrats were elected statewide. But you know, the, the civics textbooks have it right. It is a two-party state. As much as we like to say Texas is a one-party state and one party is Republican, it's a two-party state. And the two parties are the Dan Patrick Republicans and the Joe Strauss Republicans. The Democrats are the third party in a two-party state right now in Texas. And that's been the case for some time. You know, Democrats typically get at statewide elections somewhere in the vicinity of 40 to 43% of the vote. There have been Democrats who've done worse. Um, there have not really been Democrats who've done better. The exceptions prove the rule. You know, John Sharp, the last true conservative Democrat to be plausible as a statewide elected official, ran for lieutenant governor against Rick Perry in 98, Dewhurst in 90, in uh, 02, did better. Uh, you know, there have been a couple of court races in which Supreme Court candidates have done a little bit better. Joe Moody, the chairman of the House Criminal Justice Committee, state representative from El Paso, has a dad named Bill Moody who's run for Supreme Court justice a couple times, and I think Bill Moody may have gotten 46% at some point or 47%. But basically, Democrats haven't even been in contention for any of these races. You know, Wendy Davis came out of the filibuster at the legislature in 2013, some combination of Haley, Zeus, and Jesus in the eyes of some people. You know, she was riding around like Billy Jack, a folk hero all over the state, recognized at airports in the East Coast and the West Coast, able to raise money in other cities, not in Texas, and she still got beat by 20 points. I mean, this is the, even the celebrity Democrats lose. And let me tell you what, as far as celebrity Democrats go, this, this, if, if we have run celebrity Democrats in previous elections, the 2018 elections, you're going to be like, who is that person, right? I mean, this, you're going to be pining for the days of celebrity Democrats when you get into this set of elections. But the fact is that the Republicans are the ones who really run things, and they have plenty of Republicans to run things if they can simply get along. 150 members of the Texas House, 76 are a majority. They've got 95, right? 19 more than they need to pass anything. You don't need a Democrat to do anything. In the Senate, there's 31 members of the Texas Senate. You need 16 for a majority. They've got 20. You do not need a Democrat for anything. You've got Republicans up and down the statewide elected officials. They've got a conservative agenda. You'd think they just get it done. Just like in Washington, the Republicans cannot get on the same page, and as a consequence, nothing happens. You have Republicans unable to get along with Republicans. You have presiding officers unable to get along with presiding officers and with the guy in the middle. You know, Abbott's not tweeting out like little Joe Strauss, but it's effectively that, right? <laughs> you have chambers, House and Senate, that can't get along. I mean, literally, and, and here to my mind, this is like the theater of the absurd aspect of the 2018 campaign so far. Greg Abbott is now, Greg Abbott, Republican governor of Texas, has now come out against three Republican members of the Texas House who dared to challenge him on ethics matters in the last session. That's the consistent theme, that they were advocates for ethics legislation that the governor took affront uh, uh, to, he, was, he took offense to, he, in, in a couple of cases, they were things that directly targeted the way that the governor made appointments, but basically, these are Republicans. It's Sarah Davis from Houston, Wayne Faircloth from Galveston, and Lyle Larson from San Antonio. These are Republicans. They've been Republicans for years. The governor has now endorsed their opponents, and in the case of Sarah Davis, has spent six figures on ads attacking her as a liberal. And, you know, he's got a radio ad on in Larson's district in which he's talking about Larson not being a conservative and all this stuff. I've asked around. I've guessed, like I said, I've only been at the Capitol 13 sessions. I've asked people who have been there longer than me. Can you remember a time when a governor of a party endorsed the primary opponent of an incumbent member of the legislature of his party? When, when did it, has that ever happened before? Never. It's never happened. These guys can't get out of their own way. Right? You have 95 Republicans in the House. You have 20 Republicans in the Senate. You have the governor in the center office. You can pass anything, except they can't, because they cannot get along. This is D.C. Now, the coda to this, I just love. So this is Abbott. Is it's Abbott, I'm going to attack all these people, insufficiently conservative and everything else. <laughs> Last week, Dan Patrick gave a speech at the Texas Public Policy Foundation complaining against, about Republicans who criticize their own team. 
let me introduce you to Governor Abbott. <laughs> Seriously? I mean, it is just like, it's, you can't make this stuff up. So they got nothing done in the last session. People talk, oh, they always, the other thing, like so part A of the sort of standards shtick after a session is, oh, we're so great, we're not like D.C., we're so much better than D.C. Part B of the shtick is, look at all the stuff we accomplished. We're awesome. Didn't pass school finance reform. Didn't pass property tax reform. Didn't pass the bathroom bill. I know some of you like that, but the fact it. <laughs> But the fact is, you could go down a long list, the litany of things that did not happen, did not get passed, did not get done, in a body that had many, many more people of the party in power than they needed to get that stuff done, could not get done. This was the session defined as much by what did not get done as by what did. And it's the dysfunction of Washington visited upon Texas. So. Don't believe them when they tell you they're not like D.C. They're exactly like D.C. They're more D.C. than D.C. at the moment. And, I don't, and by the way, I don't see this changing. I see it getting only more so rather than less. A second observation I'm going to make is that the divide in our country is often perceived to be vertical, left, right, liberal, conservative. But in fact, it may be horizontal. And to... For this one, I, I have to acknowledge Steve Schmidt. Steve Schmidt, who ran the John McCain presidential campaign, ran, uh, worked for George W. Bush. You probably know him if you watch MSNBC. He is bald, kind of brash guy, criticizes his own team. Dan Patrick would not like him for that. Um, he was at the Texas Tribune Festival in September, and he talked about this idea that we're, we're thinking about the division in this country all wrong. He said, you typically think about it by part of your ideology, left, right. Really, it's a horizontal line. Above the horizontal line are people who benefit from the system. Below the horizontal line are people who are getting screwed by the system. And those people are not just liberals or just conservatives, just Democrats or just Republicans. I mean, look, do you disagree with this idea that the Bernie Sanders people or the Donald Trump people had more in common with each other in many respects than they had with the people in their own party during the primary, kind of came back around to meet up here. Both the Sanders campaign and the Trump campaign were predicated on the idea that we're getting screwed. Now, the, who did the screwing, that was a different, that was different, right? The Sanders people thought corporate America and Wall Street and what have you, and, and the Trump people all the government, the establishment, in some cases, other Republicans, right? But the fact is, that was the thematic connection between the two groups, we're, but we're getting screwed. Below the line, people getting screwed by the system. Above the line, people benefiting from the system. This is really the better frame, I think, to understand what's going on in the country at the moment. You want to understand why all those people in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, who were Obama voters in previous elections voted for Trump? In part, it's this. You want to understand why the people out in Trump country who are on the wrong end, on the receiving end of many of the policy decisions that have been made by the administration they voted into office have not deserted the president. Why does the president have a low ceiling but a high floor? Because at the end of the day, all they care about is they think they're getting screwed and they see him as the way to fix it. And they're not willing to, to, to take this instance or this thing or this thing and go, well, he's not doing what he said he would do. It's more of a thematic connection or relationship. They're not going to ever desert him. His approval rating will stay above 35, 36% consistently. When he said during the campaign, I could shoot people in the middle of Fifth Avenue and they would still vote for me, he was right. And it's because they're below the line and they view him as their advocate. A third observation I'm going to make is that the whole concept of participatory democracy is basically crap. In the state of Texas, we do not come close to realizing the, the opportunity and the obligations of participatory democracy or citizenship. The last four elections, Texas has had the worst voter turnout net, 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 net in the entire country. We, we love to be first and best at everything in Texas. There is this thing called Texas exceptionalism. We puff our chests out. We brag about how awesome we are. Well, 
We're first in terrible voter turnout. In 2010, we were 51st out of 50. How is that even possible? It's because we were behind the other 49 states in Washington, D.C. In 2012, we were up to 48th. In 2014, we were down to 49th. And in 2016, when we came to understand during this cycle, everyone's just activated, they can't wait to vote. You go to your house and branch library, early voting place on the first day of early voting at 7 a.m. There's a line around the block. Everybody just cannot wait to vote, 50th. Only Hawaii was worse than Texas in 2016. Net, 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 the worst voter turnout. Now, there are a lot of reasons why that is. Redistricting is the cancer on our democracy. We have made our elections profoundly non-competitive. We have basically rigged them, and then we consistently express surprise when people choose not to vote because the system is rigged. It's amazing. Um, and the media has a role that they play as well in not uh, sufficiently telling people the stakes that they have. I and mean, we've talked about that. I know you think that this is what's going to happen in the fall, but I'm going to point you back again to Wendy Davis. It is very difficult to take a moment and turn it into a movement. I will believe that all these pussycat hats will amount to something when people turn out to vote. Until then, it's a whole lot of noise and a whole lot of optimism, and I'm going to reserve judgment because I know what the history in Texas has been a voter turnout. At the end of the day, everybody being mad but not voting and 75 cents will get you a Coke. So I'm just not, count me among those who are skeptical about the possibility that this is going to be a sharknado as opposed to a wave, Right? Midterm elections, and I'm going to talk about this in a second in detail. Midterm elections in the first term of a president's, for, uh, the first presidential term, the party out of power typically gets slaughtered. George W. Bush after 9-11 is the one modern exception to that. I want to see what voter turnout looks like. Now, here is one thing I can tell you, courtesy of our reporter, Alexa Ura. We are right now about 1.6 million registered voters above where we were heading into the primary in 2014, according to the Secretary of State. Now, that is as much about population growth as motivation to vote, and being a registered voter does not mean that you vote, but it has to begin somewhere. And the fact is the registration numbers are at a record high right now heading into the primary, so we'll see. With regard to the midterm election, let me just give you a frame for thinking about that. These next two slides are courtesy of Bloomberg. In terms of the Democrats retaking the U.S. House in 2018, which many Democrats believe is the precondition to a lot of things changing or becoming better, forget about impeachment, just the idea that you need to have a place at the table and a role to assert yourself in the conversation. The average result since 1970 for the president's party in midterm when the job approval of the president is below 50% is 33 seats. So the president's party in a midterm election has lost an average of 33 seats in a midterm election when the president's approval rating is below 50%. The president's approval rating, according to the Gallup weekly tracking poll right now, is 40%. The Democrats need 24 seats to take back the House. That does not mean that they will. Democrats in Texas and elsewhere are perfectly capable of screwing it up. Time and again, time and again, time and again. However, if you look at the historical trends, if they matter to you, and this is another way to think about it, I'm just going to point out one really interesting thing here, or maybe a couple of interesting things. 2010 Obama, first term, Democrats lost 63 seats. First term of Bill Clinton, 94, contract with America, 54 seats. Even Reagan, in 1982, the Republicans lost 26 seats. The only two presidents who've really managed to do this in positive territory were Bill Clinton, which is weirdly post Monica Lewinsky. That's so strange to me. Democrats picked up um, four seats and then George Bush after 9-11. But every other modern era president, the party in Paris lost seats. 
So it's a midterm election. I mean, one of the things about this election, heading into this election, is it's a midterm election. We've already had a historic number of retirements from the Texas congressional delegation. There are eight of 36 not coming back next time for a variety of reasons. Not all of them were Blake Farenthold, right? But you also have a remarkable number of chairs from around the country, Republicans all over the country, who are just de declining to run for re-election again because they see that the signs on the wall are bad. And you know what happened in Virginia. You know what happened in, well, I mean, Doug Jones won because of Roy Moore. But you know what happened in some of these state legislative seats in Wisconsin and Missouri. And so we'll see what happens in Texas. He, he is a factor. Any Democrat running for office in Texas no matter what office you're running for, no matter who your opponent is, you are running against him. Now, as it happens, I can't show you. I don't have time to show it anyway, it turns out, Luther. But um, I, I was going to show you one video. I would say Google J. Hulings, H-U-L-I-N-G-S, and Border Wall. You do this on your own. He is a candidate, one of a, a several Democratic candidates running in Congressional District 23 against Will Hurd. This is his first campaign ad. He's running against Donald. I mean, you want, I wanted to illustrate this. He doesn't even mention Will Hurt. He just he's running against Trump. Everybody putting up ads this election cycle, it's all about Trump. And look, the Democrat, the Republicans are going to say whoever we run against, whatever we're uh, office we're running for, we're running against Nancy Pelosi. Th these elections are going to be nationalized to a degree that you cannot possibly imagine. The last point I'm going to make is my soapbox wonkiness, and that is that there are three drivers... Uh, of the future of our state that we love so much that are largely ignored and that I want all of you and anybody you talk to to be thinking about this because God knows that the legislature is not thinking about it. And their precipitous population growth, rapid urbanization, and demographic change. The entire future of the state will hinge on those three things. Number one, we have 28.3 million Texans today according to the U.S. Census. By 2050, we will have 54 million Texans. The population of Texas is going to double in about 30 years. Ask yourself whether we have the physical and social infrastructure in place in Texas, roads, bridges, water, healthcare, education, broadband, to accommodate 54 million people. Do we have a foundation to undergird all this growth or are we at risk of collapsing under our own weight? We love being a low-tax, low-service state. That's a feature and not a bug. We brag about it to everybody. But you get what you pay for, and you pay for what you get. We do not legislate, and we do not appropriate like a state that in 30 years is going to have 54 million people. That's number one. Number two is urbanization. There is this thing called the Texas myth. We're a rural state. We're a ranching state. We're an ag state. If any of you grew up in Texas, you've heard about the Texas myth for years. It's the stereotype. No one likes the Texas myth more than the former editor of Texas Monthly. You play the Texas myth like a Stradivarius if you run that magazine. I would have put a barefoot cowgirl on the cover every month if I could have gotten away with it. <laughs> the fact is, it's, it's, it is not true. Right now, three of the 10 and six of the 20 largest cities in the United States of America are in Texas, more than any other state. Houston is number four, San Antonio is seven, Dallas is nine, Austin is 11, Fort Worth is 16, El Paso is 20. Three of the 10, six of the 20 largest cities. 75% of the population of Texas today lives east of I-35. We are an urban state. The challenges of an urban state are different than the challenges of a state. They're not 100% different, but they're different, and they're significant. We do not legislate. We do not appropriate like an urban state. We're still running the same old state where the dividing line at the legislature was not liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican, but rural or urban. That fight is over, and urban has won. We need to move on, and we need to move our conversation around budgeting and passing laws to that of an urban state and not just a state. The last thing is demographic inevitability, which I think is really the most important of the three. This is the population of Texas. These two slides are courtesy of Steve Murdoch, the former state demographer and U.S. Census Bureau director. This is the population of Texas, this first one in 2000. Blue is Anglo, red is Hispanic. It's broken down by age group. In 2000, the only age group in which, that's like for all practical purposes yesterday, right? 2000. The only age group in which Hispanics outnumbered Anglos was five and under. 
Hispanics in 2000 were not even a majority of that age group. In every other age group, Anglos still outnumbered Hispanics. Here is 2040. In 2040, the only age group in Texas in which Anglos will still outnumber Hispanics is 65 and older. In every other age group, Hispanics are a majority. When you get down to school age, where it's complicated and expensive, it's three times to four times Hispanics to Anglos. Today in Texas, we're 43% Anglo, 39% Hispanic. In 2040, according to the demographers, we'll be 55% Hispanic, 32% Anglo. But that's 2040. Today in 2018, of the 5.3 million kids enrolled in Texas public schools, it's 52% Hispanic, 29% Anglo. That's today, not 2040, that's today. 60% of the enrollment in Texas public schools are on free and reduced lunch. 60% in Texas public schools are limited English proficiency. Today, the Anglo enrollment today in the Dallas Independent School District is 4.9%. The train is not getting ready to leave the station. The train left the station in 2004 when the state went under 50% Anglo population, it'll never return above 50%. We don't legislate or appropriate like this state, not even close. The Hispanic population of this state, and let me be on the record saying that I believe that the change demographically is going to be wonderful for Texas, enormously beneficial, lots of opportunities. The state's going to just be awesome uh, and, and, and more diversity is a good thing for Texas. But... The Hispanic population of Texas today has double the uninsured rate. In fact, four of the five counties in the entire United States with the highest uninsured rate are along the Texas-Mexico border. Uh, the Hispanic community has half the college readiness of the rest of the state. It has half the college completion of the rest of the state. I can go on. Broadband access in Hispanic households is 50% versus 72% for Anglo households. We have a lot of work to do as a state, and we're not doing it, and we're not doing it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stop there. I mean, I have this the couple slides about how Harvey is really going to be this massive thing, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to simply stop and take questions at that point. Um, those are my five things at the moment. Like I said, there could be five other things, but can I, Luther, can I take a couple of questions? Uh, well, if we're out of time, I'm afraid, for the taping. Okay. Well, can we have the questions not be on the taping? I'm more than happy to answer questions if you'll permit me to. We can do that. So. Okay. So. Evan, thank you for a scintillating and inspiring uh, message today. Uh, thank you for your journalism. Thank you for your tenacity. And uh, thank you for your lack of bullshit. It was great having you with us. Thank you.